Positioning Chapter 14 Positioning a Company, Xerox You can position anything. A person, a product, a politician. Even a company. Why would anyone want to position a company? Who buys a company? And why would a company want to sell itself? To whom? To protect themselves against unfriendly takeovers, most companies would like to be invisible. The buying and selling of companies. Actually, a lot of buying and selling of companies is going on. Only it's called different names. When a new employee accepts a job, he or she buys the company. With its recruiting programs, a company is actually selling itself. Who would you rather work for, General Electric or the Schenectady Electrical Works? Every year companies across the country compete for top graduates at the nation's leading universities. Who do you think gets the cream of the crop? That's right. The companies that occupy the best positions in the minds of the prospective employee. The General Electrics, the Procter and Gambles. And when investors buy a share of stock, what they are really paying for is a piece of that company's position, now and in the future. How much a person is willing to pay for that stock, 6 or 60 times earnings, depends on the strength of that position in the buyer's mind. Positioning a company effectively has lots of advantages if you happen to be an officer or director of that corporation. It's not easy, though. The name problem again. First of all, the name. Especially the name. Would you believe that Pullman doesn't happen to be much of a factor in the railroad car business anymore? And that bus revenues represent only a small part of Greyhound's total sales. Both Pullman and Greyhound have changed drastically. Yet the way they are perceived by the public has scarcely changed at all. Their names have locked them to their past reputations. Yet they have tried. Especially Greyhound, which has spent millions of dollars telling the financial community that it is more than a bus company. But as long as those buses with the long slim dogs on the side go zipping up and down the interstate highways, the corporate advertising is an expensive mistake. If Greyhound wants to be more than a bus company, it needs a new name. A more than a bus company name. But even with the right name, the corporate positioning job isn't done. Your company's name ought to stand for something within your industry. Standing for something. Consider Ford. Everyone knows that Ford is an automobile company. But what kind of car is a Ford? Ford can't build a corporate position on a specific kind of car, because it builds them in all types and all sizes, including trucks. Whether it should or not is another matter. So the positioning question boils down to some quality to be found across the board in all vehicles. The company has settled on innovation as the key attribute in a vehicle from Ford. Result, the Ford has a better idea campaign. Not bad, but many corporate programs settle on a mundane and hackneyed approach. Of which the most mundane and hackneyed, perhaps, is one based on people. Our people are our greatest resource. Golf people, meeting the challenge. Grumman, we're proud of the many products we make. We're prouder of the people who make them. Are there no differences in quality between the people in one company and those in another? Of course there are. But it's quite another matter to build a position based on better people. Most people think that the bigger, more successful companies have the better people. And the smaller, Less successful companies have the leftovers. So if your company occupies the top rung of the product ladder in the prospect's mind, you can be sure that the prospect will also think that your company has the best people. If you are not on top and you tell the prospect you have the better people, well, that's one of those inconsistencies that doesn't usually get resolved in your favor. If Ford really has the better ideas, why doesn't it use them in the marketplace to overtake General Motors instead of using them in its advertising to impress the public? This is not a question of fact. Ford could have the better ideas and still be in second place. This is just a question that springs up in the prospect's mind. And your advertising, to be successful, must answer this question. Diversification is not the answer. Next to people, the most common corporate positioning theme is diversification. Companies want to become known as diversified manufacturers of a wide range of high-quality products. But diversification is not effective as a corporate advertising approach. As a matter of fact, the two concepts of positioning and diversification are poles apart. It's a fact of life that strong positions in the prospect's mind are built on major achievements. Not on broad product lines. General Electric is known as the world's largest electrical manufacturer. Not as a diversified maker of industrial, transportation, chemical, and appliance products. 
even through General Electric makes thousands of consumer and industrial products, most of its successful products have been electrical ones. Most of its unsuccessful ones have been non-electrical products. Computers being a typical example. General Motors is known as the world's largest builder of automobiles. Not as a diversified maker of industrial, transportation, and appliance products. IBM has a reputation as the world's largest computer manufacturer. Not as a worldwide manufacturer of many types of office machines. A company may be able to make more money by diversifying. It should think twice, however, about trying to build a position based on that concept. Even the stock market consistently undervalues conglomerates like ITT and Gulf and Western. Many companies are worth more broken into parts than they are worth whole. Sometimes companies think they are concentrating their communication efforts when they are really not. The positioning concept becomes so broad that it is almost meaningless. Which company used to call itself a developer and supplier of information systems for work, education, and entertainment? Would you believe Bell and Howell? That's right, Bell and Howell. How do you develop an effective position for a company? Let's look at Xerox, a company that seems to already have a position. What's in Xerox's mind? Why would Xerox want a position? Xerox has a position. Xerox is the Coca-Cola of copiers. Quick, name another copier company. Nothing jumps into the mind, does it? Sure, after a while, you probably can remember that Sharp, Savin, Rico, Royal, and Canon make copiers. Even IBM and Kodak make copiers. But nobody owns the copier position the way Xerox does. This is an enormous advantage in selling copiers. When you think your company needs another copier, your first thought is Xerox and your first telephone call is most likely to Xerox. So what's the problem? Xerox sees the office market moving toward systems, especially computer-based information systems. So Xerox bought Scientific Data Systems and subsequently changed the name to Xerox Data Systems. Our objective in acquiring SDS, said the chairman, was to offer broader-based information systems. We feel that to really seize the opportunities around the world for supplying information, we had to broaden out from graphics, as IBM is broadening out into graphics. People in the 70s who can say to a customer, we can handle all your information needs, whether fashionably transmission, graphics, or whatever, will have an enormous advantage. Six years later, Xerox data systems folded. But the loss of XDS didn't stop Xerox from trying to broaden the company's product line. Xerox was still committed to the concept of going beyond copiers. In the years to come, Xerox introduced a parade of office automation products. The XTEN network, the Ethernet network, the Star workstation, the 820 personal computer. Now the industry will know our secret for certain, declared a Xerox vice president. We want to be number one in this market. What's in the prospect's mind? If Xerox would look into the minds of its prospects, it would quickly see that moving into office information systems is not in the cards. The trade publication Information Week recently surveyed a sample of its subscribers. The magazine has 100,000 subscribers, 80% of whom represent companies with 1,000 or more employees. It would seem that this is the heart of the office automation market. Here are the answers given when subscribers were asked. Which manufacturers of office information systems are you most interested in? Xerox didn't make the charts. What can Xerox do? Our message to Xerox is to stop fighting copiers. You can't change what's in the prospect's mind. Start using copiers. They could be your strongest asset. An asset in a strategic war with IBM and AT&T. The third leg strategy. It's a way for Xerox to take advantage of its heritage. As with many strategies, it's helpful to step back and get a sense of what has been going on in the marketplace. Let's look first at the office of the past. Things were simple then. To put yourself in business, you got a telephone from AT&T, a typewriter from IBM, and a copier from Xerox. Now look at the office of the present. All the action has been in the typewriter leg. Typewriters have been supplanted by computers. The telephone and copier legs have hardly changed at all. What about the office of the future? If you believe everything you read, the office of the future will have a single leg consisting of an office automation system supplied by a single vendor. IBM, of course, is everyone's bet. As a result, every manufacturer worth its computer is chasing this single vendor idea. But systems don't always sell. 
The high fidelity audio system was never supplied by one vendor as consumers picked the receivers and turntables and tape players they wanted. The same went for the home entertainment center and the dream that GE had to sell all the major appliances in the kitchen. The woman of the house picked her favorite brands. Furthermore, even if the office of the future should turn out to be one big system supplied by one big manufacturer, it's unlikely that Xerox would be a major factor. Therefore, Xerox has nothing to lose and everything to gain by betting on a different scenario. The third leg scenario is a different view of the office of the future. It's a view that sees the office of the future as still having three legs. The telephone leg of AT&T becomes a communication leg with the addition of voicemail and facsimile equipment. The typewriter leg of IBM becomes an input or processing leg with the addition of computers, workstations, and networks. The question is what will Xerox add to the copier leg? Some cross-log difficulties. There's a good deal of evidence that the merging of legs is not the way of the future. History points to the difficulty of many cross-leg activities. Take Xerox versus IBM. 1. Xerox has not been very successful with computers, workstations, or local area networks, all of which belong to the leg owned by IBM. 2. On the other hand, IBM has not been very successful with copiers, a leg, or position, owned by Xerox. Take Xerox versus AT&T, 1, nobody, including Xerox, has done very well with facsimile equipment, a leg owned by AT&T, 2, voicemail and facsimile will take off as soon as AT&T gets behind them. Take AT&T versus IBM, 1, AT&T won't do well with computers, a leg owned by IBM, 2, on the other hand, IBM and Realm won't do very well with telephones, a leg owned by AT&T. Satellite Business Systems is losing $100 million a year. Even since Scientific Data Systems, Xerox has been trying to bridge the copier-slash-computer gap. Instead of being an obstacle, the copier-slash-computer gap in the long run could turn out to be Xerox's strongest ally. Third Leg Opportunities If at and -T's telephone leg has become the communication leg and IBM's typewriter leg has become the input and processing leg, then what has Xerox's copier leg become? The obvious answer is the output leg. There are many third leg opportunities for Xerox's offices at computer printers, scanners, and storage devices to complement their copiers. Furthermore, a hot new technology is moving into the output side of the office. That technology is the laser. There are laser printers, laser typesetters, laser memory systems. Furthermore, the laser is making a name for itself in many other places. In communication, the laser is beginning to replace satellites. In the hospital, the laser is revolutionizing heart surgery. In the supermarket, you find laser checkout counters. McDonald slash Douglas talks about a laser that is capable of transmitting the entire contents of a 24-volume set of encyclopedia in a single second. United Telecom is setting up a nationwide laser network. AT&T is laying down a transatlantic laser link. GTE is bouncing laser beams off the moon. In the consumer field, there is the laser video disc player, the laser audio disc player, and the laser everything disc which can play both video and audio. No self-respecting rock show would end without a laser light show. Even Ronald Reagan's Star Wars satellites would be equipped with nuclear-powered laser weapons. The fourth technology. In the past 30 years, three technologies have roared through the office and into the dictionary. The first was thermography by 3M a photocopying process that uses infrared rays to produce a copy on a special type of paper. The second was xerography by Xerox, a copying process that uses the action of light to produce a copy on plain paper. The third is the microprocessor technology that computer companies like IBM have dominated. There's an opportunity for Xerox to put another technological word in a yet-to-be-published edition of Webster's Dictionary. The fourth technology would be called lassography. It could be defined as the process of communicating, printing, scanning, and storing optical or printed messages with the use of laser beams and optical fibers. One word can say a lot. Xerox is a $9 billion company with more than 100,000 employees. It ought to be impossible to position an enterprise as big and diverse as Xerox with a single word. But in an over-communicated society there is only so much room in the mind. Today Xerox means just one word copiers. Tomorrow Xerox could use lassography to create a broader mental position. Lassography says new and different, and the business world loves things that are new and different.
Lassography sounds like a basic technology somehow related to xerography. In other words, it connects with Xerox's last big technology. Lassography from Xerox, the company that's perceived to be in the ography business. Lassography uses lasers, which are perceived to be on the leading edge of technology. Lassography is the one concept that takes advantage of Xerox's position and broadens it to include the next generation of products. In the positioning game you can't sit still. You must constantly be alert to keep your position targeted to today's problems and today's markets. Chapter 15. Positioning a country, Belgium. With the advent of relatively inexpensive airfare, we're fast becoming a world of tourists. In days gone by, international travel was limited to the older, more affluent person. Today that's all changed. There was a time when the flight attendants were young and the travelers old. Now the travelers are young and the flight attendants are old. The Sabina situation. One of the many North Atlantic carriers jockeying for these international travelers is an airline called Sabina Belgian World Airlines. But all competitors don't compete on an equal basis. TWA and Pan AM, for example, have for some time had a long list of gateway cities in both the United States and Europe. But Sabina flies non-stop from North America to only one city in Europe, Brussels. Unless there was a hijacker aboard, every Sabina plane was going to land in Belgium. While Sabina captured the lion's share of the traffic to Belgium, they were on a very meager diet. Not too many people were flying to this little country. Only one out of 50 North Atlantic passengers fly to Belgium. On the country ladder in the prospective traveler's mind, Belgium was on one of the bottom rungs. If it was on the ladder at all. One look at the situation and it was easy to tell what was wrong with Sabina's advertising. Sabina was using classic airline strategy. Sell the food and the service. Do I have to be a bone vivant to fly Sabina, said a typical ad. But all the terrific food in the world won't induce you to fly an airline that isn't going where you want to go. Position the country, not the airline. Sabina's most productive strategy was obviously not to position the airline but to position the country. In other words, do what KLM had done for Amsterdam. Sabina had to make Belgium a place where a traveler would want to spend some time. Not a place you traveled through to get to somewhere else. Furthermore, there's a moral here that shines through loud and clear. Whether you're selling colas, companies, or countries. Out of mind, out of business. Most Americans knew very little about Belgium. They thought Waterloo was a suburb of Paris and the most important product of Belgium was waffles. Many didn't even know where the country was. If it's Tuesday, this must be Belgium, was the title of a popular motion picture. But how do you find a position for a country? Well, if you think about it, the most successful countries all have strong mental images. Say England and people think of pageantry, Big Ben, and the Tower of London. Say Italy and they think of the Colosseum and St. Peter's and works of art. Say Amsterdam and its tulips, Rembrandt, and those wonderful canals. Say France and its food and the Eiffel Tower and the dazzling Riviera. Your mind sees cities and countries as mental picture postcards. In your mind, New York is probably a skyline of tall buildings. San Francisco is cable cars and the Golden Gate Bridge. Cleveland is a great place with a lot of industrial smokestacks. Obviously, London, Paris, and Rome are all top of the ladder destinations that are most popular with first-time travelers to Europe. Sabina had little chance to get these travelers. But in the United States there is a large segment of seasoned travelers looking to visit the next tier of destinations. Countries like Greece with its ruins. Switzerland with its mountains. Once the objective became clear, finding a position wasn't that difficult. Beautiful Belgium. Belgium is a beautiful country with many of the things that appeal to the seasoned European traveler. Like interesting cities, historical palaces, museums, and art galleries. Oddly enough, many Belgian people don't have a high opinion of their own country as a tourist attraction. That attitude is perhaps epitomized by a sign that used to be at the Brussels airport. Among other things it said, Welcome to Belga country. Weather, mild, but rains 220 days a year, on average. As the result, Belgium's favorite tourist strategy was to promote the central location of Brussels as a gateway city and the ease of getting somewhere else. Like London, Paris, and Rome. If you want to visit New York, fly to Philadelphia because it's close by. There's an important lesson here. The perceptions of people living in a place are often different from those visiting it. Many New Yorkers fail to see New York as a tourist attraction. 
They remember the garbage strikes and forget the Statue of Liberty. Yet New York attracts 16 million visitors a year who all want to see those big buildings. Three star cities. But while beautiful was a good position, it wasn't really enough as a tourist promotion theme. To position a country as a destination, you need attractions that will keep the traveler around for at least a few days. Nobody considers Monaco much of a destination because its number one attraction, Monte Carlo, can be seen in an evening. Obviously, size is an important factor. Big countries have lots of attractions. Small countries are at a disadvantage. If the Grand Canyon ran through Belgium, you wouldn't have much land left to look at. We found the answer to the overall positioning problem in one of those Michelin guides. You may not know that Michelin rates cities as well as restaurants. Michelin's Benelux edition lists six three-star, worth a special journey, cities. Five were in Belgium, Bruges, Ghent, Antwerp, Brussels, and Ternai. But what was really surprising was the fact that the big tourist attraction to the north, Holland, had only one three-star city, Amsterdam. The ad that resulted was headlined, in beautiful Belgium, there are five Amsterdams. The illustration was comprised of five beautiful four-color pictures of Belgium's three-star cities. This advertisement generated an enormous number of inquiries about a country many travelers had seen only through the train window as they traveled from Amsterdam to Paris. One of the inquiries came in the form of a call from the Minister of Tourism in Holland to his counterpart in Belgium. Needless to say, there was one irate Dutchman who wanted that advertisement killed, along with the people who created it. The three-star city strategy had three important things going for it. First, it related Belgium to a destination that was already in the mind of the traveler, Amsterdam. In any positioning program, if you can start with a strongly held perception, you'll be that much ahead in your efforts to establish your own position. Second, the Michelin Guide, another entity already in the mind of the traveler, gave the concept credibility. Finally, the five cities to visit made Belgium a bona fide destination. Eventually the three-star cities of beautiful Belgium concept was moved into television. The response was substantial. A television commercial with its ability to communicate in sight and sound can drive pictures of a country into the mind much more quickly than a print advertisement. There's also a danger of misusing the medium of television. This happens when your visuals are similar to visuals being used by other countries. Think about those islands in the Caribbean you've seen advertised. Can you keep those palm trees and beaches separate in your mind? Do you conjure up the same mental postcard when someone says Nassau, the Virgin Islands, or Barbados? If there's no difference, the mind will simply dump all those visuals in a slot marked Islands in the Caribbean and tune out. The same thing can happen with those quaint European villages. Or the smiling residents waving mugs of beer at you. We solved the problem by using the Michelin stars as if they were church bells which rang out as they were superimposed on the Belgium city scenes. What happened? Now you might be wondering why, after all this, you haven't seen much about Belgium and its three star cities. A number of events kept this program from getting off the ground. All of which holds a lesson for anyone embarked on a positioning program. New management not committed to the program arrived on the scene, and when headquarters in Brussels wanted to change the strategy, they quickly acquiesced. The lesson here is that a successful positioning program requires a major long-term commitment by the people in charge. Whether it's the head of a corporation, a church, an airline, or a country. In a constantly changing political environment, this is difficult to accomplish.